And they said, here, try this book. And they gave me this 900 page block. It was like a huge brick. And I was like, oh, okay. But you know, back in those days, I think it was 50 cents a word when you were a reviewer. I think it's now five cents a word or nothing. But back if then, only it was, was 50 cents per word you read. Oh my God. Yeah, I could have retired. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pledge of the Text podcast, a shared imaginary space where readers and writers meet me together. We are your hosts, Shannon Gareth. Good morning, Shannon. What an amazing book we read for this week. Yes, it is an amazing book. I It is actually Under the Skin by Michelle Faber, and this is his debut novel, and I would just be over the moon if this was my debut novel. It is an exceptional book, and I can't wait to dig in and talk about it today. A bit of housekeeping, though. If you are loving our podcast and our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe and also share with all your friends and family and they can also listen to us review other amazing books that we get the chance to talk about and also creative writing exercises and everything that we do here, which is quite a lot, isn't it, Gareth? It is a lot. It is. And I, I feel as the sort of the person who worries about the semantics of these things. Last time we did say Michael Faber. Uh, now, the reason uh, why we said that is it can be pronounced Michael Faber. And in fact, my middle name is Michael without an A. And I pronounce it Michael. You can call me Michelle if it makes you happy. Um, and I, I was saying to Shannon before the podcast that it's kind of like the difference between mercy and murky, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about later. Uh, you know, whichever way you want to do it. But you know, the other thing is that he didn't. Uh, it wasn't his first novel. It was his first published novel, but he'd written, I believe, The Crimson Petal and the White and then stuck it in a drawer. So for all you, you draw novelists, you know, for all you people <laughs> out there that have a novel in a drawer, M- Michelle Faber did this too. And he actually, uh, the reason why he did that is uh, because it was set in the wrong century. So he wrote it in the 1980s, about the 1980s, and something was amiss. And then he finally realized that the problem was it wasn't set in the 1880s and then it all flew together. But that whole book took him about 20 years to to get into publication. And in between, there's this rather stunning novel, Under the Skin. And a quick synopsis on Under the Skin. Isley picks up hitchhikers with big muscles. She herself is tiny, like a kid peering up over the steering wheel. She has a remarkable face and wears the thickest corrective lenses anyone has ever seen. Her posture is suggestive of some spinal problem. Her breasts are perfect, perhaps implants. She is strangely erotic yet somehow grotesque, vulnerable yet threatening. Her hitchhikers are a mixed bunch of men, trailer trash and travelling postgrads, thugs and philosophers. But Isalee is only interested in whether they have families and whether they have muscles. Then it's only a question of how long she can endure her pain, physical and spiritual, and their conversation. Michelle Faber's work has been described as a combination of Roald Dahl and Franz Kafka, as Somerset Maugham shacking up with Ian McEwan, at once humane and horrifying, Under the Skin takes us on a heart-thumping ride through dangerous territory our own moral instincts, and the boundaries of compassion. Wow, bloody hell. Uh, I see you're, que- yeah, you're questioning the, um, the correlations there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I didn't see a lot of those similarities, but, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, good think, reads, you know, it can't always yeah. be right. Yeah, we all see things differently. That's all fine. So, yeah, so Michelle Faber. This is your first uh, Michelle Faber book, Shannon? This is my first Michelle Faber book, and I, you've mentioned a couple of times on the podcast um, Crimson and the White, and I do need to get my hands on that book. I am a little bit scared. I've heard it's a, a monstrous book to read, mm. but um, you said it's a, a masterpiece, essentially. It is a masterpiece. I really do think it is. So it was the first book I when I when I was a strapping young fellow, I rocked up to Good Reading magazine offices and said, "Well, here I am. 
And, you know, clearly you're going to want me to do some book reviews for you because I'm tremendously clever. And, you know, much to my current surprise, they went, yeah, that sounds right. And they said, here, try this book. And they gave me this 900 page block. It was like a huge brick. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, But, you know, back in those days, I think it was 50 cents a word when you were a reviewer. I think it's now five cents a word or nothing. But back then it was... If only it was 50 cents per word you read. Oh, my God. Yeah, I could have retired. (laughs) Um, uh, But, you know, I think that basically the idea was no one else wanted to review this book. It was just too thick. Um, So, you know, I I sort of thought, no worries, this will be fine. But obviously I was terrified. Uh, But very quickly I was drawn into it and couldn't stop. Like I basically was putting off other things to do this book review, which wasn't, you know, imminently due, but I just couldn't stop reading the book. Um, and it had that, uh, Dickensian sweep where you, you feel like you're just being drawn into this world and leaving it would be an absurd thing to do. Uh, just having a quick cat moment. Um, yeah. Oh, hello. All right. Yes, yeah, very professional. Um, so this is Dory, everyone. I think she's made appearances on this podcast before. Uh, obviously, she has her own Patreon page. Uh, the details will be in the description, won't they, Shannon? Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, she uh, she enjoys donations of kibble. Um, but yeah, no, I was stunned by this book, and I was stunned by a feature of it that I'd never seen in a book before, which was an, a, an absurd degree of overt uh, literariness. It was a very literary book, but it had uh, an absurd amount of commercial appeal as well. And I thought to myself at the time, this might be, you know, something new, like a, a new forefront of fiction. Um, and I was, yeah, I was very stunned. And so, so I read it, I reviewed it, gave it a glowing review, one of the very few I ever gave that were really glowing. And, uh, and then I went back and read his other work, uh, which is also fantastic. Um, and obviously nothing after 2002, which was when this was all happening. So the Crimson Pebble and the White was his newest work at that time. Uh, but one of the works that I read very early on was Under the Skin. And for me, uh, it is a book that – it's a science fiction book. Uh, people seem to want to say it isn't, but it is. Um, but it's a profound science fiction book. It's one of the great science fiction. Oh, hello. One of the great science fiction books. Do you agree? And so, it, I yeah, agree. what do you think? And other authors do the same. So Stanislaw Lem, uh, Journey to the Stars, science fiction, but also an amazing literary novel. Um, so I agree on that front. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I, I suggested this book with my vague memory of, of having loved it. Uh, and you read it before I did. And uh, so what were, what were your first impressions? And I think you also watched the movie, and I'm curious about your impressions of that too. My first impressions were I love the way Michelle Faber lays out the very first introduction or the first chapters of this book. So we're introduced to the character is early. She's driving on the A1 highway through the Scottish Highlands and he does a good job of framing each sentence, how taking the mundane of what we're so used to and what we're so used to seeing and painting it in such a beautiful, opaque way. And you instantly understand that there's something strange about Isoli. And then as the book progresses, you find out, you know, she's not looking um, to pick up these hitchhikers for sex, which is what I originally thought. You know, she's looking for large, strapping, muscular men. What else do you need men for, right? And um, we find out she's actually collecting them and harvesting them to send back to her home planet so they can eat. Uh, Vodsu, is that the word for it? A vodso, and I feel like we've done this thing we always yeah. do. Apologies, folks. This review is going to contain spoilers. Oh, uh, yes. Spoilers galore, <laughs> because when we review books, we're really just discussing them in a, in a, in a sort of an excited way. Uh, so mm. if you don't like spoilers, uh, then this possibly is not the time to be listening to this review. 
Um, what you should do, though, if you haven't already read Under the Skin, is go and get it now as fast as you can. Read it quickly. I left it to the last minute because I had a few other things on. I powered through it. And actually, here's a good way of doing it. I've got the audio book and I put it on 1.2 speed and read along with the audio book. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Got it done in no time at all. Go do that and then come back and you'll enjoy this review much, much more. Mm. And so she collects vodsels and it's quite a horrific practice. So they bring them in, they burn all their clothes, they cut out their tongue, they castrate them and they fatten them up for a month and they send them off uh, in a ship to her planet. And one steak of vodsel is worth one month of fresh oxygen and water. So this is quite a, a prized commodity that she is bringing back to her home planet. And in between the start and the end, the magic happens, and we're going to be talking about that a bit more, but a great novel. It is, it is. And so, so we're Vodsels, you and I. Well, actually, no, was there a name? Yeah, because it's Vodsel like feels like pork, doesn't it? Like it's not pigs, it's pork, and humans are Vodsel. And I do wonder, given that no no women are harvested, because really they're not fattening them up exactly as sort of uh, filling them up with protein Marbling. so they've got all this flesh, um, but very little fat on it. So they're, they're sort of muscular, but in a way that's not uh, practical. Um, I, I oh, recall yeah. a scene where that... someone throws something and they're so muscular they can barely – fling it because they're they're just all that kind of prize meat but it's not yeah Useful. or maybe muscle isn't the word yeah, the it's, way, it's flesh well the way i ma- imagined it was uh very much of you know the concentration farming systems that we have fattening up uh pigs beef chicken trying to get that marbling effect especially for uh, our beef that we consume and there is a scene where they they try to escape well they're released uh, by the potential love interest in the book and they're trying to run away and they can't get over fences properly. They can't get enough speed up to get away. So, yeah, it's very useless flesh that they're putting onto them. Mm, and, and it's an interesting thing too because we get to know some of these characters potentially. Uh, it's hard to know who's mm. whom, but they have very distinct personalities as they're sitting in the car with her and she's vetting them as it were. Um, and, and so when you see them all reduced to a sort of a homogenous mass of bodies that also seem to have a degree of perhaps it's profound trauma or one wonders if uh, there's some brain damage that occurs because uh, the final Vodsel in the hunting scene um, mistakes them for a, uh, another car and the hope of salvation and basically, uh, you know, climbs into their car and surrenders himself up. It's, it's all very disturbing, but so we're Vodsels and I, I really think that's like pork. Uh, and now what are they? What, what is this Lee? We Do you, don't you know? really know. They throw descriptions. We don't know where her planet is. We don't know exactly what they are, but they define themselves as human, as men and women, and we get these details. So they've got long snouts, they've got four legs, they've got beautiful fur that is an attractive quality to them. That's what is desirable amongst their culture and their society. And they have a prehensile tail, and a prehensile tail is different to a dog's tail. You can actually sit on your tail, you can bounce, you can grab things. So it's a, a another appendage really and so that's the extent of what we know about them and back to the point where we get to know each of the hitchhikers that she picks up michelle Faber does this really cool technique where we jump into the heads of each of the hitchhikers and what i think he's doing there i mean it's it's due to the title of the novel right under the skin who is this person that i'm picking up what are their inner thoughts their dreams what are their concerns And it, again, drastically brings us into, oh, this is another human being. This is another creature uh, who wants to live, who wants to achieve something. And so you're 
ripped in and out of just thinking of these hitchhikers as a food source, but also thinking of them as something else, something other. Yeah, and the and it's sort of a it's a very democratic process because some of the hitchers are quite good people. Uh, some of them are not great, uh, but they all end up mm. the same way. There's no justice to this. Uh, the concept and, and actually, Michael uh, oh, did it again. Michelle Faber said, "You know, people have come up to him and said, thank you. I'm a vegetarian because of your book.' Uh, and he has to tell them, I'm I'm not a vegetarian.'" My book wasn't a, a plea for vegetarianism. It was about the way in which people don't take moral responsibility for what they do, uh, which, you know, yeah. you, you can you can spin that out in a lot more ways, and that's very interesting. And, and it should be said that Isolu doesn't become a true believer. She begins to doubt and she begins to empathise but it's not as though she suddenly goes, you know, those vodsels are great. Go look after the vodsels. Um, she does make a very small, well, maybe not a small effort, but she 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 makes a gesture towards the end of the book uh, in terms of protecting uh, a vodsel potentially. But when that appears not to be viable, she abandons the idea, uh, which is really much more true to life and, and much more affecting, I think, than having her just have some mm. sudden uh, epiphany. I think that she does have a very small change of heart and that's when, and I'll just read the section from page 272. Vess Incorporated had just one extra request of her, it seemed. They were wondering if she could perhaps see her way clear to supplying them with a vodka or female preferably one with intact eggs. There was no need to process the female. Just wrap her up carefully, send her along, and Vess Incorporated would take care of the rest. To me, that is the turning point that she thinks I've had enough. Whether or not she changes her perception on whether consuming uh, vodsels is right or wrong, this is her breaking point, and she decides to try go out into the world and live on her own at this stage. Is that what do you put that down to, though? What, what, what is the breaking point specifically? Do you, do you feel? I think that because she has a level of disdain for the love interest. Do you remember his name? I'm Alice, really bad Alice with names. Is his name. Yeah, yeah. It's lucky I found it, and I think she sees a correlation between what this. Vodsal's female life will be like once she goes to her planet and it'll be very similar to her, her treatment on that planet. So she didn't want to go to what they call the underground, which sounds like a very dismal place to live. They have to purchase water. They have to purchase oxygen. Uh, it's very grubby and disgusting. And she was given an opportunity to come to this planet. Given that she she has the ability to feel compassion in that moment and that's when she changes slightly. Not, again, that it's right or wrong to consume these fossils, but being captured, being tortured, being used as a commodity as she has been makes her see a bit of uh, compassion for them. That's interesting. I did not read it that way. I, I, I felt that a big turning point for her occurs in, uh, in Chapter 8, uh, I don't know if we're meant to say trigger warnings here, but there is a there is a sexual assault in that chapter. Um, the way it's written, it's it's up, you know, it's it's a tense and upsetting scene, but it's not traumatic. I think Faber handles it really well in terms of what Isali is concerned about, which is of course being discovered as not being uh, a vodsal, and. Fortunately, she gets control of that situation, and that's that's good. But I think that in a weird way, even though she's being uh, tormented by a vodsal, I think on some level that is an emotional turning point in terms of her empathy. But I understood the the, the female as being a replacement for her, that the idea they have is that they can – do something with this this woman and make her the bait and so Isolee will cease to be useful. Um, and she has 
I mean, I you, you get a feeling almost that they're like wolves, but of course they can't be because she shaves her face and is able to appear human or human enough. So, so clearly that idea of wolfishness, which is what really came through for me, is is not quite right. Uh, and obviously, a wolf doesn't have a prehensile tail and so forth. So a bit different, but I but I did find my that was one of the very few things about the writing that I felt was maybe not as strong as it could have been, which is that I I land on this idea of a kind of a wolfishness, and I and I had to use sort of logic to make myself go, well, that can't be right. I think there's quite a lot of descriptive material that makes you lean in that direction. I don't know if you agree. I mean, I'm the guy that when we did a secret rendezvous, just kept thinking the back end was a horse uh, and I just couldn't seem to get myself to think otherwise. So I could be way off here, but, but did you, did you see something canine about them, Shannon, or am I, am I, this is just my reading. Uh, I did see something canine about them and there were a few descriptors of them being more cane, uh, canine like but there was a point where she releases a dog from a van of a hitchhikers that she's taken and the way she describes the dog and it doesn't relate to her in any form again made me shift my image of them again and I think that it might be a flaw as you say but I think that was one of the magicness of it that I could never get a solidified solidified impression of what exactly she looked like before the surgery before she was mutilated so Anlis actually mentions that her face had been cut off in half and a, a fake nose implanted on her face oh i must have missed that in my speedy reading that it, that that makes a lot of sense um yeah uh, i uh, could so, read the section if you want oh my god you're across it yeah please please do alarmingly he reared up and stood at her shoulder and lowered his head close to hers shockingly close. Easily, listen to me, he urged her, the black down of his face bristling, the warm breath from his mouth tickling her neck. Do you think I can't see that half of your face has been carved off? Do you think I haven't noticed that you've had strange humps grafted onto you, your breast removed, your tail amputated, your fur shaved off? Do you think I can't imagine how you might feel about these things? I doubt it, she wheezed, her eyes stinging, of course I can see what's being done to you, but what I'm really interested in is the inner person he pressed on. Oh, please, Anlis, spare me this shit, uh, groaned easily, looking away from him as the tears squirmed out of her eyes and ran down one cheek to disappear inside the ugly stoma of her mutilated ear. Do you think nobody is capable of noticing you're a human being underneath, he exclaimed. So, yeah. That's beautiful, that's yeah. That's a bit of description. Mm. Well, obviously, I glossed over that. Um, yeah, I mean that is that is lovely, and uh, you know, again, it's this under the skin idea uh, of, of true empathy, and and she really struggles to see him as a sort of a legitimate equal to her in some ways because of his privileged background. Uh, she finds him trivial, and perhaps he is. You never really get the sense for sure that anything's going to come of it mm. with him. And I have a, a quote to read so we can kind of get an idea of the trivialness that she attaches to him. <laughs> well, I've confirmed my worst fears, he went on, disregarding her claim. This whole trade is based on terrible cruelty. You don't know what cruelty is, she said, feeling all the places on and inside her body where she had been mutilated. How lucky this corseted young man was to have a worse fear that concerned the welfare of exotic animals rather than any horrors he himself might have to face in the struggle for survival. So the point she's making there is she identifies as human and the cruelty that was done to her and yet he doesn't seem to notice that or Vest Industries doesn't and he's more concerned about exotic animals. Uh, I would say similar to ourselves and our society so People go on about vegetarianism and veganism, which is, you know, a good thing as well. And yet we disregard people starving and in poverty in all the countries of the world as well. And we seem to have a blind eye to some of the cruelty 
inflicted on lots of beings. Mm, yeah, no, definitely. I think I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do, I, I'm going to read you a uh, about a page and it is the sexual assault scene. So please, uh, please note that that is occurring. And um, obviously, if that's uh, if that's not something you want to hear, skip ahead a couple of minutes. I I do feel that this is a really important scene, though, um, because it, it ties some things together, and it also gives you a real sense of how Faber has dealt with her body. So I'm going to read this, and, and let's see what you think. Turn around, he said. She obeyed, and he immediately grasped her green, velvety trousers and tore them down to her knees with a single jolt. Jesus, he growled from behind her. You been in a car accident? Yes, she whispered. I'm sorry. For a heady moment, she thought he was discouraged, but then she felt the flat of his hand on her back, pushing her forward onto the car's bonnet. Desperately, she searched for the right word, the word that might make him stop. It was a word she knew, but had only ever seen written. In fact, only this morning, a vodsal had spelled it out. She'd never heard it spoken. Murky, she pleaded. Um, and then a little bit, I'm going to skip across a tiny bit here. Allowing herself to slump flat against the bonnet, her breasts and cheeks squashed against the smooth metal, she laid her hands on the cheeks of her buttocks and pulled them apart. Her genitals, she knew, were buried forever inside a mass of ugly scar tissue caused by the amputation of her tail. But the scar lines themselves might resemble the cleft of a vodsal's sex. It's um, it's pretty powerful, isn't it? It's it's. Uh, I think Faber has done really well in getting across the trauma of the scene, but also kind of maybe allowing the reader a bit of breathing space by keeping it in her mind and in terms of her greater fear of being um, discovered as not being a vodsal or one of us. But yeah, when she pleads murky, which of course should be uh, mercy, um, there's a there's a reference to this. So, so the scene with the vodsal actually occurs and there's a lovely... There's a lovely uh, bit where she um, uh, Amla says, well, "What does that word mean? Is it a word?" And and she knows that it is, but she she has to really think about what the word is. And it's just a tiny paragraph. Isali considered the message, which was mercy. It was a word she'd rarely encountered in her reading, and never on television. And yeah, I I think that's a that is it's true, isn't it? Like. The concept of mercy is not one that we hear about or or have to think about very often. It doesn't really play out in human experience a lot of the time. I was quite struck by that. Um, and then when she she makes that attempt at it with murky, I, yeah, I think that's incredibly powerful. I, I was... Uh, I'd forgotten it, of course, because I always do. But when I reread it, I was uh, my breath caught in my throat. It was very powerful. Yeah, I do remember reading that scene and having to put the book down afterwards because it was a strong scene. And what I remember is that that scene where the Vodsal has written Mercy and she kind of lies to Aimless and she says these people don't really have a language and language is the way that we interact and the way we develop empathy and compassion and mercy. And that actually relates to another section a bit later on when she takes Aimless to go see the sea. In time, a flock of sheep walked single file along the fringe of cliff at Appalachia's boundary. Their fleeces glowed in the moonlight, their black faces almost invisible against the gauze. What are those, marvelled Amless, his nose almost squashed against the windscreen. They're called sheep, Isley told him. How do you know? Isley thought fast. That's what they call themselves, she said. You speak their language? He goggled as the creatures trotted past. Not really, she said. A few words. He watched them, every last one of them, his head moving closer and closer to Isley's as he followed their slow progress out of his experience. Have you tried using them for meat? 
asked Amlis. Izzily was dumbfounded. Are you serious? How do I know what you people have got up to? Izzily blinked repeatedly, fumbling for something to say. How could he even think of such a thing? Was it a ruthlessness that linked father and son? They're, they're on all fours, Amlis. Can't you see that? They've got fur, tails, facial features not that different from ours. But I thought in that moment, her decision on what's morally right and what's mor- morally wrong in terms of eating another species is whether it looks like them, it's got legs and a face like them, yeah. as opposed to interacting on a language basis. That was her deciding factor if it had four legs or two legs. Yeah, and we do something, we, we don't really worry about the two legs, four legs thing, but we do, I mean, again, with dogs, dogs are part of our life. You know, we've sort of evolved with dogs. Uh, and I should say I am not in any way endorsing the eating of dogs. Um, but, you know, the difference between a dog and a cow in terms of behaviors and so forth, I mean, a cow can be an extraordinary pet. They will play fetch. They will do all kinds of things with you. Um, they have quite deep internal lives. Uh, but we we see a distinction, and it's an incredibly arbitrary distinction, really. Um, indeed, yes. you know, uh, and again, I'm I'm not endorsing cannibalism, but there are certain taboos that we've we've allowed to exist and that we think are meaningful. Uh, but they are they are arbitrary things to a large extent, um, and they allow us to believe that you know the the, the eating of some meat is. Uh, more morally acceptable um whereas you know and again you know I'm, I'm not suggesting people become vegetarians you must do whatever you wish um but but we do kind of create these interesting blindnesses for ourselves and Italy is a really good defamiliarized representation of those blindnesses in fact a lot of this book is built on defamiliarization which you know obviously it would be but there's some great examples of it in the use of human. They, they call themselves humans. Uh, that, that's quite a jarring effect. It's very clever. Um, and, and there's also, so this is the sort of the last bit of the book that I wanted to, to read. So I'm just going to read you the beginning to begin with. Uh, Isley always drove straight past a hitchhiker when she first saw him to give herself time to size him up. She was looking for big muscles, a hunk on legs. Puny, scrawny specimens were no use to her. At first glance, though, it could be surprisingly difficult to tell the difference. You'd think a lone hitcher on a country road would stand out a mile like a distant monument or a grain silo. You'd think you would be able to appraise him calmly as you drove, undress him and turn him over in your mind well in advance, but Italy had found it didn't happen that way. So that's the beginning. And as you say, it really does feel like she's looking for a hookup, doesn't it? Very much so. Uh, Now, this comes back to us. In Chapter 10, there's an interesting – I don't think the book sort of has a part one, part two sort of situation, but it does have a couple of blank pages, which suggests some kind of separation before the beginning of part 10. Perhaps a beginning again? And chapter 10 begins this way. Isley always drove straight past a hitchhiker when she first saw him to give herself time. That was what she'd always done. That's what she would do now. There was a hitcher in her sights. She drove past him. She was looking for big muscles. Puny, scrawny specimens were no use to her. This one was puny and scrawny. He was no use to her. She drove on. And this is obviously after the rather um, upsetting... Chapter 8. Now, just a page over. Just a page over. We get... And I think it's interesting that she's she's left quite a gap between the beginning and Chapter 10, obviously, the, 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 the echoes of one and the other. And then... Did I say she? Oh, never mind. He. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> Yeah, Italy gave us time. So Faber then sort of uh, underlines this in a really interesting way, just over the page. He says, two and a half hours later, there was another hitcher in her sights. Isley always drove straight past a hitchhiker when she first saw him to give herself time. So she drove past him. So he's taken the two sort of 
two sections that begin the be, uh, that begin the novel and spread them across two pages and defamiliarize them in a really interesting way and at that point so much of what goes on before floods back uh in a new form and it's quite horrifying and desolate and I think that use of repetition, of defamiliarized repetition, is incredibly powerful. And it really shows a writer, you know, who knows what he's on about. He knows what he's doing here. Uh, and, yeah, I, I was really struck by that and wanted to share it. There's a lot of other things uh, going on in this book, a lot of technique uh, that, that is really impressive and hopefully slips by you on first read because that's the point. It is a... A really good book and I enjoyed it immensely I can't I can't find fault with it I think this has got to be one of those books that you I personally will reread and reread as time goes on and I'll get more out of it and I kind of want to segue here to uh, a couple of reviews that were done on Under the Skin and the first one which piqued my interest and I think we should talk about it Gareth is a review by the Independent Review of Books now, it starts, Under the Skin by Michelle Faber is a novel that slips dream science fiction but remains in literary realms due to the author's careful theming and character journey. Readers are forced to see earthlings as animals and aliens as humans. The reader must reconsider what cruelty and mercy are when things are upside down on a planet that slaughters thousands of animals per second. I'm going to jump again. Faber avoids becoming trapped in the sci-fi genre by not showing certain aspects of the story. In much the same way, Kazuo Ishigura's equally hybrid novel Never Let Me Go does. By avoiding genre tropes, the reader never discovers the mechanics of the ship, nor do we visit Izzily's planet, only glimpsing memories of horror. If we did, we might have to suspend disbelief and the book could fall into the realms of science fiction. So, this review, and I would like to know your thoughts, it's spending a lot of time trying to argue that in what I take, it's bad. it would be bad if this was defined as science fiction genre as opposed to a literary novel. Well, yeah, it's conceived of as a trap to be avoided. Mm. It's a very strange attitude. It's a very common attitude. You know, science fiction is is defined you know in terms of a sort of a i suppose a kind of a futurism and typically or a sort of an alienation of of the present it's very much again grounded in the concept of defamiliarization and i really don't i mean genres uh exist to sell books uh, you know, it's a way of, it's an easy shorthand way of going, oh, I like science fiction, so I'll like this book. But of course, that's not true. I like science fiction, but I've read so many science fiction books, so I've gone, Bleh, why did I bother? Uh, it's not the science fiction that you like. There are, there are ways of playing with ideas in science fiction that are, I think, unique to it and interesting. And some books are good and some books are not so good. But the idea that literariness is something that you have to navigate around genre is, uh, well, there's no basis for it. I'd love someone to explain how that works. You know, I mean, in terms of science fiction tropes, uh, there are clearly some at play. But, I mean, really, uh, with a setup about an alien character, you're not going to not have some tropes because other people have written about alien characters, particularly alien characters on an, on an, on earth or seeing us as aliens. This has been done before in various ways. And it's typically often very interesting when it is done, but the basic idea, I mean, I don't know what kind of trap really Faber could have fallen into and why science fiction would create a greater chance of, of such a trap, uh, you know, catching him. I, I, I've never understood this concept. I, I don't think there's anything underlying it, honestly. What, what were your thoughts on this? Because obviously you've, you've, you've pieced this out. So how, how are you viewing this? With annoyance. It's this concept that you can't read, and I'm thinking of um, Ursula Le Guin here, with her Earth 
fantasy trilogy, an amazing fantasy novel, and that you can't have a book that exists within genre, whether that's sci-fi or fantasy, and not have it be a work of literary genius, that it moves you through the characters, through their development, through everything else. And I just think she's a bit off the mark here in her comments. Uh, they're, they're kind of elitist comments. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they were well meant, but they are obviously very elitist. And, you know, ultimately all writing will take the familiar and defamiliarize it. You will not find this to not occur at any point in literature. This is just how it is. Science fiction has some more familiar elements, some elements that have been explored by multiple writers in multiple ways. If, if there's a danger in writing science fiction, it is that you haven't sufficiently defamiliarized your inspirations, that you've ended up rewriting them. But that danger occurs across all fiction. So it's not a particularly interesting or insightful thing to sort of say one has avoided pitfalls of, of science fiction to remain literary. I would say that any book that you would describe as having literary merit of, of being a good, well-written piece of work, whether it's in a genre or it's been granted the, uh, the crown of general fiction, uh, they all achieve that. It's, it's a sort of an unremarkable statement. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think it really means anything. All the great works of science fiction have achieved the exact same thing. And all the ones that you write off as being not very good, you could also, you know, lump them in with general fiction that's not very good. It's just, you know, it's marketing. Genre's kind of pretty meaningless, really, in my opinion. You know, you tell someone the story, they go, oh, that reminds me of Lord of the Rings, that, that Earthsea book. That's a bit like that. And in that similarity, they may see something that attracts them, but you don't have to formalize it into fantasy. Uh, and that those things are marketing things. And did you want to talk about Michelle Faber's wife and how he's managed to work between genre and literature? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I will do actually is I'm going to – so Michelle Faber um, is a Dutch-born author and he moved to Australia. I'm not actually sure when he moved to Australia, but he was educated here. And, you know, being Australian, uh, we should want to try to adopt him and say in he's 1967. ours. Okay, so he was quite young because I think he was born in 1960 or maybe, 19, yeah, 1960. Yeah. So, you know, he came here when he was very young and because he's a great writer, I feel like as Australians we should be adopting him saying, yeah, no, he's ours, he doesn't belong anywhere else. And I believe he met his wife here and then she suggested they move again to Scotland. And, you know, I, I, I think in many ways he is a Scottish writer, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, you can't, you can't steal them all. Uh, but Eva was a, was a very important person in his life. They were married for 26 years uh, and she passed away in uh, 2014 uh, from cancer. I, she had a big effect on, on Faber. She pushed him to pursue his work. He was the kind of writer that chucked his novels into drawers. She said, no, 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 get them out there. She encouraged him to write short stories and enter them into competitions, which he subsequently won. And that's how Cannon Gate came a knocking and, uh, and how we got the wonderful under the skin. So yes, it's, it's, it's incredibly sad that, that, you know, he lost her and she was his, his main reader uh, she, she was the one that sort of gave him his initial feedback. So I'm just going to read you a quick quote from an interview that um, Faber did in 2016. It's an incredibly moving interview with um, Justine Jordan uh, in The Guardian, uh, and I would, I would recommend uh, people go seek it out. It's, it's quite powerful. Uh, and the title of the, the interview is um, I Would Have Been a Different Writer Without My Wife. The, the part I want to read you is, this is a couple of paragraphs, and he's talking about poems that he has written about the process of the feelings of having lost his wife. So, the poems are also the first work Faber has published without Eva's editorial input. She was his first reader and a fearless critic, in which Faber describes as a three-way relationship 
me, Ava, and the work. Quote, that feels very, very strange, he says now. It is so much a part of who I've been for the past 26 years to show her everything I've written and ask for her advice. End quote. Eva supplied characters for the novella The Courage Consort, which is an excellent novella, demanded a more luminous ending for the book of Strange New Things, and helped shape the mood and plot of all his books. Quote, I would have been a different writer without her, he says. I might have written an uncompromising novel that was admired by the chap from the TLS, but I'm not convinced I would have reached the number of people I've reached. Eva always wanted me to be more inclusive. She was always curious whether it was possible to embrace just a few more readers by being just a little kinder, by giving them a little bit more of what they wanted. In the early years together, Eva and I had some intellectual collisions where I would be insisting, this is just the way I want it. I don't care if people can't relate to it. And she would be saying, would it hurt so much to tweak it just a little? I've ended up being a writer who is quite uncompromising and distinctive in a way that would usually doom the work to a very small readership. And yet by my standards, I've got quite a large readership. It wasn't large enough for Eva's liking. She always wanted it to be bigger. But I think it's extraordinary how many people have read those books. I think this is, um, this is what I saw in The Crimson Petal and the White. I, I'm quite sure she was heavily involved with that. And it does manage to be commercial. And it really, when you talk about commercial writing, you're talking about people's expectations. Commercial works, successful commercial works, hit, hit certain notes that people expect, that they find familiar and satisfying. Like like in music, you know, when when you when you resolve back to the, the 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 main chord, and you feel like yes, that's that's right. Um, and I think that's a drive in all of us, and I don't think it's something to be disrespected by sort of suggesting that it's a trap you can fall into. And yeah, and I think I think for him, he perhaps would have been a more discordant writer, writing some experimental Philip Glass kind of prepared piano sort of books. And and she sort of said, maybe there are ways to resolve things in ways that will please readers more without giving up what you're trying to do. And I think that's very sensible and profound. It's uh, similar advice that James Joyce's wife tried to give to him. He ignored it. Now we've got Finnegan's Wake. Um, and, <laughs> you know, Ursula Le Guin talks about this, that, that, that it isn't, it, it's a compromise, but it doesn't compromise the writer. There are very two very distinct strains within Western literature of the literary and the commercial, and it is foolish to suggest that one is superior to the other just inherently. I don't think that's true. I think they both do things better than the other. They do different things. Uh, and the writers who grab people and really mess them up, managed to do both things. And I think that's what Faber has done. He's managed to do both things. It's an incredible achievement. Uh, and I think you'd find commercial readers and literary readers would, would just love his work because it works on both levels and it's satisfying on both levels. And if you like both, you get doubly satisfied. So that's pretty cool. Mm. And then there is a little bit of talk about the movie and I am. Oh, I was just reading that. I am very interested in your thoughts on the movie. So I loved the movie, uh, and I know it's almost unrecognizable on a narrative level. You, you weren't so pleased with it. Did you watch it first, uh, or did you read the book first? I watched it afterwards. I'll actually just read this paragraph from the same article before I go into talking about my experience of the movie. Please. He had experienced periods of depression and mental fragility before. Quote, I was so despairing and so distressed for so much of the 90s, convinced that I would end up possibly homeless or as some kind of fringe dweller. End quote. For Faber, that is what Jonathan Glazer's 2013 film version of Under the Skin, not as he says, an adaptation of the book as such. Quote, but my God, is it inspired. Caught so well. My own sense of being doomed not to make it, wanting to move away from the alien that I had been as a younger person, 
but feeling that I didn't have what it took to become fully human. That was the core of the book for me, that journey from alienness to humanity, end quote. Like all these books, Under the Skin is dedicated to Ava, quote, for bringing me back to earth, end quote. Her support wasn't just literary, emotional, and practical. It was cosmic as well. So I agree with you and your comment that it's not a true representation of the narrative that we have in Under the Skin, and that's why I didn't enjoy the film because I had just come off this amazing high of this fantastic book. I loved everything about it. The The environment was a huge part of it for me, just the desolation of driving on this highway looking for people. And they've changed that slightly in the film to her being in a city picking up people. And there is a few other different elements to it, a spoilers alert for the film. In the end, Isley does die in a similar fashion. She's burnt alive, as we could imagine, is what happens in the car crash at the end of the book. But I do agree there was that sense of alienness, her inability to somehow, being the other, fit in with the people around her. There was this kind of love relationship affair going on. I think they were about to have sex and he realised something was wrong, at which point she runs away. So there are those elements that are captured quite beautifully in the film. I just had an expectation that wasn't met in that moment. Yeah, I because uh, for me, obviously, the two were very far apart. Because um, when, when did the film come out? It wasn't that long ago, was it? 2013. Right. So I read Under the Skin, I guess, uh, it would have been in 2002 or 2003 after I read The Crimson Petal and the White. Uh, and then obviously, so that some, you know, 10 years have gone by and my memory being what it is, I had a vague memory of her going around in the car and picking up people for reasons that are not what you think they are. I think what they did really well in the movie, is it Jonathan Glazer? Who's the director? Yeah, Yeah. he's a fascinating director. So this is a mistake that a lot of filmmakers make. They, they have a great story and they try and squeeze it into 90 minutes and under the skin, the way it is written will not fit into 90 minutes. It just won't. So for example, her isolation amongst her own people, that would take a great deal of time to establish in a cinematic sense. So, in, so instead she's all alone. And I think the, I mean, I, Scarlett Johansson reminds me so much of Elizabeth Taylor in the film. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's intentional. She's quite stunning looking in the film. I, like I, um, I, you know, I appreciate that she's a, a, an attractive lady, but uh, I've never really sort of thought, my goodness, she's stunning. But I, I, under the skin, I found her stunning. And I found her stunning in a way that I found weirdly unsettling. And I don't know what they did. I think they lit her very well and they position her very well. And at times she looks quite animalistic. She's got this big head of hair and she looks terribly small in it. And of course, she's not that small a person in real life, but they've, they've shrunk her down by, by changing the dimensions of her body. And uh, I think the, the thematic and the emotional notes in the book are caught in the film, even though the plots are really very different. I, I felt uh, not having not being able to grasp the plot anymore because too much time had gone by. I remember seeing the film and thinking, this is a perfect representation of the book. But again, I'd forgotten pretty much all the plot. <laughs> uh, so I remembered a few beats and, uh, and nothing else. I think, I believe in the film, and I may have imagined this because I haven't watched the film either in a while, but they're floating in a gelatinous mess under the, like in the floor of the yeah. ship or something. That's a very beautiful kind. Of, like, it's like they're in aspic. If you, you know, in terms of meat, they're like jellied meat in the floor of the ship. And I think that's a great way to portray it because, of course, we wouldn't have been able to empathize with her the way we can with Isley in the book because Isley in the book has a voiceover. She, we have her thoughts. In the film, we don't get her thoughts. So if we saw them being fattened up and castrated and having their tongues burnt out, 
I suspect we would have struggled to empathize with Isley in the film. Uh, and so I think Glaze is very smart to do away with all of that and just give us the, the sort of veneer of loneliness. And she never seems to fit in. Like she always seems strange. Just another cat uh, looking to get on the podcast there. He's, uh, he's working his way from the side of the room, but he may be over soon. Yeah. So um, just an extraordinary book by an extraordinary writer. And Faber has said, you know, that he's not going to write any more fiction for adults. Uh, he said that back in 2014, that that, that was it. Um, I believe he may be shifting from that position. I certainly hope so. Uh, because yeah, we're, we're a better planet for, uh, Michelle Faber writing books for us in it. Good God. That was an awkward way of saying that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I don't have much else to say except go and get your copy folks. This was a really enjoyable read. Fantastic published debut novel, not his first, and also Crimson. Yeah, also Crimson Petal in the White. And drum roll, please, Gareth, for our next book reveal. I don't even think you know because we've been um, I, I don't. Um, and ahhing about it for a while. So it is The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall. Yay. Yay. Oh, I'm very excited <laughs> about that. All the self-publishers out there, this is a self-published novel. Uh, and for everyone who's uh, interested in queer fiction, this is like a key book, isn't it, in queer fiction? It is a huge book. And we talked about it in our podcast, Banned Books. This is one of the biggest banned books. It was banned and she never actually saw the release of it because she unfortunately passed away. But it's a one of those cornerstone pieces for the um, queer community out there. Yeah, and for readers, you know, this uh, Radcliffe Hall, she's another of those Virago forgotten writers. Uh, you'll you'll see that we actually did a, a podcast uh, on the, uh, the the women writers, the forgotten writers. Nobody's watched it. Come on, fellas, like like get out there and check this out. You need <laughs> to do it. Yeah, and but but even in that space, Radcliffe Hall remains a very marginal figure, and she should be better known. I think. And so maybe in our own small way, we can lend a hand with that. Bring her up to infamacy. Yeah, yeah. You know, get a, get a very popular amongst our 53 YouTube subscribers and others. And uh, that, would be, that would be an achievement. I'd be proud of that. Well, I'm going to jump online right now and get my copy from Boomerang Bookstores, mm-hmm. uh, the one we are affiliated with, uh, readers in Australia. So... And I think that is it for today. Yeah, this has been a short one for us. Goodness me. Yeah, I almost don't know what to do with myself. I I feel like I need to keep talking, but I'm going to stop and I'll let everyone go get their cups of coffees or whatever they need and sit down on a comfortable couch and start reading The Well of Loneliness. Absolutely. Well, this has been fun, Shannon, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks for whatever we're doing then. And uh, my gosh, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks on The Pleasure of the Text. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.